that's it for my introduction. And with that to tonight's main event, uh, who is Thomas Krause from Thing Online? And I think you are joining us tonight from Karlsruhe. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Germany, same time zone, uh, <laughs> at least. And the topic tonight is a bit, yeah, not outside, but a bit beyond, a bit broader than the Atlassian ecosystem. Um, and Thomas is the founder and CEO, I think, of a new startup, which is called Thing Online. And Thing Online is a collaboration tool, workshop tool that helps people to stay ahead or be ahead of the innovation curve or in the curve of, of this in, in distributed organization, because that's everybody's problem. We are all at home, all our organizations are distributed and how do you organize innovation in a situation like this? And with that, without further ado, over to you, Thomas, and I will just disappear and see you on the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Jörg. Trying to share my screen. And uh, yeah, I thought, what if we use a small topic for the beginning of the year, um, how to stay or how to be innovative um, in distributed organizations. And um, I want to talk, um, introduce um, you a little bit of why this is a topic for me and some of my, some of my peers. Um, so, um, Actually, the pronunciation of thing is ting. And why is this the case? Because um, we go back to the European um, history a bit and, and learned that people, humans always uh, came together to tackle complex topics. They met the Vikings and North Europeans um, to solve conflicts, to discuss relevant uh, topics and make decisions together. Um, so this is a bit of a history, thousands of years back. If you look to the two center uh, pictures, this is where I was busy as an um, employee of a global company the last oh, 12, 14, uh, 14 years. So part of my job was um, community management and knowledge management in the, in the virtual world. So part of it was an administrator and consultant for JIRA and Confluence, and later on also introducing uh, Teams and the Microsoft um, stack. Um, so this was a part of what I was doing. And the other part was uh, bringing people together in the real world um, as a coach and learning and development uh, consultant. If you look at this uh, chaotic picture of people gathering together in the real world. and. Um, as you know, since a couple of months, um, all of uh, almost all of the knowledge-based organizations are kind of distributed organizations because we're working uh, online to a large degree. And um, for me individually, um, the story continued with a startup called Ting. And this is not a whole uh, product placement uh, workshop or um, talk today, but I will come back to that because what we think is that the state of uh, technology for uh, these video tools is that we are able to communicate remotely. Um, however, we think that there are better ways to really um, become or stay innovative as a company when working uh, online. And we come back to that. Let's start with what is innovation uh, anyway? And I looked up a lot of definitions this morning. What is innovation? Um, I put the link in here that you might, um, if, the, if the slides are shared, look up later on. Uh, 15 experts saying very different things of what innovation is. And one of it that I got appealed to was anything that is somehow new, useful, or surprising. Anything that is not just what we're used to, where we need to coordinate. Um, so see the pile of things that we need uh, to do, see the pile of things that are currently in progress and see the pile of things that are hopefully uh, done. So uh, coordination uh, tool wise, you could map to um, things like uh, Jira, for instance, if you want to look into the Atlassian stack. Um, it's not only uh, could be a part of it uh, collaboration. So if we think of content collaboration, then um, we have Google Docs um, 
Uh, here, since years, we have uh, the Atlassian stack uh, Confluence, and we have the Microsoft stack with all the nice uh, Office tools and a lot of other newer tools like Notion um, and more that don't come to my mind now. Um, do things together um, as a team, as a group. Um, and then it's not only about uh, commu communication. So having means as text or as um, audio or as video or all of this um, to, to have an information channel to share information with, with each other. So all of this is ne might be needed um, to be innovative, but if you have only these things established in your company, no, you're not necessarily uh, innovative. And there are people who claim that with these remote only settings, these companies have learned to coordinate, to collaborate and to communicate remotely. But in a couple of months, they will see, oh, but what about innovation? What about the water cooler discussion um, where, where our ideas are shared with each other? What about the design thinking workshops that you might have in your, um, in your uh, company? What about um, all the other um, meetings, workshops and rituals that you had to spark the thinking in a, in a group? Um, but let's go to the, to the second part of the topic of tonight. Uh, what are we talking about if we say distributed? And there are different shades of distributed. Um, and I steal this um, from, I think it was Martin Fowler. There's also the link underneath here, um, an article from I think 2012 or so. Um, well, the ideal situation was seen as you are co-located. Co so a team uh, shares a single office, um, the desks are um, nearby and you could at any time say, hey, Martin, can you help me out with whatever topic? Um, so this ideal situation um, is asked by a, by a lot of um, uh, coordination and, and innovation frameworks like um, Agile and Scrum and design thinking and whatnot. However, this ideal situation is not existing anymore for a lot of organizations, even uh, before Corona phase. Um, so multi-site is um, the most usual, I, I would think, a situation for most organizations. So you have country uh, sites or you acquire the company at some point in time. Um, and um, instantly you are a multi-site organization and you have to deal somehow um, to, to put information back and forth between uh, different groups. Um, a situation that we also saw a lot, especially with uh, freelancers or um, there might be um, um, uh, a company um, developing software for you, uh, somewhere in India or in other countries, um, you had satellites. So the core of the organization might be at one side um, sharing the same office and then there are people outside. Difficult situation because um, it's, it's um, challenging to create a situation where people um, can, can really work on the same, on the same level. And then remote first, I mean, this was kind of exotic uh, for a couple of years. So there are organizations who don't have an, a headquarter at all. They, they exist totally in the virtual uh, world, but it, these were just a few. And even if an, if an organization is located in one city only, the remote first um, approach is the common one since a couple of months. And there are people, and I don't wanna go into more detail um, tonight here, who claim that for organizations seeing this, that this remote first structure works and part of the studies even claim that productivity is even higher than before, um, we're expecting that remote first will be a, um, an approach for a lot of organizations even after this phase. And we will see a lot of changes in the world of work, I expect. Um, some aspects of what makes innovation possible at all. Um, I think that the balanced combination of autonomy and enabling constraints, and I will come to that in a, in a couple of seconds, um, is one of uh, two of the aspects that um, 
let innovation emerge. So autonomy, um, or let, let me uh, stay on the slide here for, for a little bit. Um, and if you balance these two aspects right, then things like serendipity, so the, the lucky occurrence of you find something, an idea that you didn't, didn't look for um, may happen. You may be able that people feel that they are in a safe space. So they, are, um, they feel like they can speak up, they, they can ask silly questions or they can bring up their ideas or experiment um, and feel safe to fail and learn out of it. Um, you, you can work with creative tension. So if people are um, open enough to speak up, then you see that um, people are different and have different ideas. And you have at least a starting point to cope with these different ideas. And you allow emergence to take place. So it's not like everything is clear and planned. So you are able to move into this unknown space um, together. Sounds a bit abstract. Autonomy on a more... Um, concrete level um, is the right or the condition of self-government. And as an example, I took, some of you may know them, uh, the principles of open space. And I think they fit very well to, to autonomy in general. Um, so uh, whenever it starts, it's the right time. Whoever comes are the right people. When it's over, it's over. And whatever happens is the only thing that could happen. So this is the, the, this borderline between chaos and structure where you want to uh, work with it and especially the law of two feet so you you have the right to either join a circle or a conversation or you have um, you have also the right to leave a conversation if you feel you can't contribute anymore and I skipped the butterfly and the bumblebee for the informal part later on if you have questions about that one um, enabling constraints the second aspect um, and I see as the best example here are, are rooms. So rooms make invitations. They make an invitation to either shut up or listen to, to a slide set as we do now. So you are not able to speak up and I have the right to, to talk here for a couple of minutes. Um, and if you look at the, the left side of, the, uh, of, of this, this picture on the left side or on the right side, these rooms make very different invitations. Um, and currently we speak about the real world here. Um, I'll leave it to your imagination that also virtual rooms can make invitations in a different way. Another way to um, establish enabling constraints is working with powerful questions. And latest here, you, you see that I'm kind of a, of a coach and facilitator. So it makes a difference if you are in a, in a workshop or in a meeting with a group, um, the kind of questions you're asking. Um, I don't know, extreme, uh, whose fault was that versus what can we do to improve next time? What did we learn? Things like this. And these are just a few examples here. And uh, the right questions or good questions can make a big difference to go beyond the obvious thinking, to spark new thinking and to catalyze insights. We continue a bit um, with um, a process uh, topic here. So I called this breaths and stepping stones, uh, borrowing the term from um, the art of hosting. So if you look into very different uh, frameworks and, and schools, I borrowed here from a book called The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision-Making. I borrowed from the art of hosting. On the left lower side, it's a design thinking diamonds, um, looking into the problem space and the solution space. And the last one is um, uh, a scrum retrospective and, and the way it is processed. So as a facilitator, as a group, you always try to, to open up a thinking space uh, to some degree, then go to a so-called grown zone. So this is where it's uncomfortable, but this is where the new emerges and then have a convergent zone where we at some point in time make decisions and as a foundation for our next steps or do the planning or whatever it might be. Um, and the last one about enabling constraints here and I could find um, a couple of more examples is time boxing in general. So I don't know how I'm in time, Jörg might 
help me out if I'm talking too long. Uh, but time boxing helps to um, not talk and discuss things endlessly and move to the next step as a group. Having temporary or more persistent roles in a meeting. I took these here, but um, there are more examples like being a, a timekeeper, being a moderator, being a scribe um, is also something that helps to generate outcomes in a, in a meeting. And the last one related to collaboration, uh, canvases as thinking tools are also enabling constraints because they guide us going through these um, fields to, to focus our thinking to one aspect of the, of the whole topic. And bringing it all together, um, as an example, uh, some of you might have heard of it, uh, Liberating Structures is a collection of facilitation structures, uh, group work structures, uh, 33 of them are published um, that help people and, and, and teams to really generate outcomes in their, in their workshops. And on the right hand side, you see something called a uh, liberating structure string. So if you put these so called microstructures um, together, um, you generate this um, um, process structure that I showed before opening up the thinking, going through the ground zone, and converging at the end of a workshop. Now, what? This was not really about tools yet. This was not really about distributed. This was generally about um, autonomy and uh, enabling constraints. Um, and this is uh, maybe in between break to have one or two or three questions in between and then continue. Is there something? So there are currently no questions. Um... If you have any at this point, use the chat or the Q&A box. Ah, there's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, can I see it as well? Uh, q and let's say. What is Ting? <laughs> um, I come to that um, in, the, um, in the end of the workshop. I didn't want, didn't want to put it um, in, the, in the center here. With Ting, and we come to that in the tools section as well, um, we create a tool um, that tries to um, generate a virtual room where autonomy and enabling constraints um, are established so that people can have innovation workshops more easily. So a lot of people in the facilitation um, um, community struggle the last few months bringing all these tools together, having video, having question and answer tools like Mentimeter, having tools uh, like uh, Miro for a white for virtual whiteboard and bring all of this together with uh, smaller and, and especially bigger groups. Um, so we come to what is Ting uh, in more detail later in the, the presentation. So anything else? Other questions at this point? No. And I guess that question, what is Ting? I guess we should proceed and then. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, now what about distributed and uh, what about tools in general? Um, if we look at the challenges that organizations have seen the last few years and especially the last few months. So there were people, um, coaches, trainers, and others who said that um, facilitated meetings, uh, meetings that have a structure, an agenda, and someone who guides the group uh, through the process, generating outcome, is something that helps. Um, but somehow it was, and partially still is, a black art. So facilitation, what does it mean? Um, standing on the flip chart and doing something. Um, so that is still a challenge for organizations. Should we hire uh, facilitators? Should we train internal employees to be better facilitators? And in any case, um, I mean, if we look at the number of organizations that are out there in the world, um, it's still a one-to-one -one thing. So you can have one facilitator per seven people, but somehow it doesn't really, really scale to have well facilitated meetings for every organization. And then organizations more and more became distributed. So 
what they did was obvious. So they used the available tools, the tools like uh, Zoom um, uh, developed the last 10 years and Teams developed the last hmm, four or five years or so. Um, this is what, what people use today for at least having remote communication. Um, however, all these tools are developed from the perspective of we need uh, video capabilities um, and not necessarily about a specific use case um, to, to improve that one. So that led to, hmm, now how do we do well-facilitated meetings online? <laughs> one of the solutions so far was um, established as best or good practice, meanwhile, um, is have a technical co-host. That's what they call these co-facilitators. The one who um, takes a look at the Q&A session, does a check with me if the screen sharing uh, works in other uh, context uh, takes care of creating um, the breakout rooms and things like this. Um, so where we asked for, um, where we, there's a question, I come back to that later. Um, where we asked for a facilitator for a group before, we're now asking for two facilitators. So somehow that doesn't scale at all, uh, in my opinion. Um, and the question is open, how can we sustainably innovative in a distributed uh, world? We'll come to that. Now let's take, this is a bit complicated, but let's see if we can find our way through here. So on the x-axis, we have the richness of the communication channel. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the communication effectiveness. Uh, we have an area that talks about mainly asynchronous tools, and we have one that talks about synchronous tools, mainly. Um, and I simplify this a bit. Um, so if we remember email, we somehow uh, became aware that this is not the best tool to do a one-to-many or many-to-many -many conversation or to have a structured overview of what needs to be done. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Jira was established to have our, our piles of things that need to be done in a structured way and be able to filter and query them and visualize them. And we have tools like Confluence, where I think it was even a, um, a claim that they had have a single point of, uh, of truth for your team and not um, having it somehow cluttered into, into email. And things like Miro and more of these content collaboration tools do also uh, belong into this area, while we see that uh, partially the vendors try to put them also into the synchronous um, area where we now can, multiple people can collaborate on a confluence page together at the same time. And the same is true for Miro. You can work on this whiteboard, multiple people, even a hundred people um, at the same time. Um, so th this part, I mean, the tools get uh, incre incrementally better and better, um, but more or less, um, we consider this part as, as, as done uh, because organizations are able to work globally and coordinate with Jira software and also put content together with Confluence and other tools. And then there is a group of tools, just as an example, Slack and Teams. Um, at the core, there are uh, group chat tools, and you may be aware that Lassian had at least uh, one of it as well. So one was um, HipChat, and I don't remember the second attempt. Hmm. We'll come to that <laughs> later. Um, and these tools, not only there are group chat tools, but and, and work between asynchronous and uh, synchronous, um, they also try to integrate a lot of these content collaboration tools with plugins. Stride, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jack. Um, well, let's go to the to the synchronous side. I mean, um, we have phone calls uh, used for for decades, and interestingly, while most of these uh, video conferencing tools like WebEx and LogMeIn and whatnot uh, are available for at least a decade. Um, uh, we didn't use them. So at least in, in my previous company, uh, people used it for sharing the slides, but no one um, enabled the camera. So this has changed last, last March. Um, and this is where we are currently. And then there is, and I, 
come back to what the, the agile and the design thinking people prefer. They say you have the most richness uh, of the communication channel and the most effectiveness with face-to-face -face communication. So a couple of, a bunch of people in a room, a bunch of people in a room with a whiteboard. And this is the place where we struggle with the existing uh, tools. We somehow try it and the best of the facilitators are able to put together Zoom and uh, Menti and Miro and whatnot and, and uh, facilitate workshops, but it's not mainstream. So it's difficult to do and it's challenging. And this is where we're trying to play with, with Ting to allow more organizations more often to be able to decide for a virtual workshop. So if we think of big organizations, they work multi-site globally, but every now and then if they work in less or safe environments, they bring together all the people uh, by planes for a week or so into the headquarters, being it in the US or wherever um, uh, globally. And um, we think that there is a reason and, and Corona is a, just one of it and was a trigger for us to um, have better tools here to, pro, to, to support these kind of scenarios. Um, workshop where people need to work in very different combinations um, for half a day, for a day, or even multiple days. Um, a little bit about our approach. Uh, so we already mentioned uh, autonomy and here it's claimed uh, assisted facilitation, which is more or less one-to-one -to, -one to this enabling constraints in a unique combination. Uh, we want to establish or allow conversations in an autonomous way. So you can start, join, or leave conversations um, almost like, like you would do it in a, in a, when being in a room together. Uh, you can collaborate um, on content like whiteboards or documents together. Um, and for facilitators as well as for the team, um, the tool also takes care of supporting you with the flow of the meeting. Uh, like there is an introduction, there is a check-in round, there is a first question, and then we have multiple activities and we have a closing round, for instance. Um, a little bit of how this will look like. Um, these green uh, areas here are conversations where we help people to easily uh, step in and then they can open up um, content collaboration in these areas. Um, they can autonomously join or leave at any time, like it is in a real room. I mean, if you're really bored of a facilitation workshop, you leave. And that's what you should uh, be able to do um, here as well. Um, and if the facilitator asks to close your conversation and come back into the main circle, you should be able to finish your sentence or finish your, your topic and then decide as a group to come back. If you um, ever um, um, saw breakout rooms in, in Zoom, it works, yes. But if the, the counter is down to zero, it just puts you back into the main room, which is not very, uh, doesn't feel very good. And the second is an, exa <clears throat> an example for one of these liberating structures. In the middle of the circle, um, there's an area where people, um, like we have it here, a, a panel, they can get uh, heard and seen. And the outer area of the circle is the listening circle. And people can move between these areas um, and also leave the circle on the term anonymously. So what at the end of this talk? Um, we think that um, organizations that want to be ahead of the curve now need to learn how to go beyond remote communication, coordination, and collaboration. So more and more organizations are on that level, meanwhile, um, with the help of um, uh, COVID-19. A new breed of tools, and Ting is just one of it, um, there are multiple uh, tools that are in an experimental early uh, stage, will help to make the move to remote innovation accessible for more organizations. Um, and a disclaimer here at the end, tools will always help us with the complicated parts of work only. The creative, the complex part will be left to us. And I think that's a good thing to hear. 
And um, do you have some guidance to embrace and build trust in teams, new teams and new organizations? Because trust is the base for good collaboration and innovation. That's right. How do you build up trust when you are a facilitator and you don't know anything about the lived company culture, trust and behavior? Um, and maybe Frank is now also in here and can help me to... Uh, so understand the question. Everybody is able now to activate audio and video if yeah, they want to. So um, my question is about like, if you have like some guidance as a facilitator, if you come to a new company or to a different team uh, where people are not used to speak out uh, because they don't have that uh, balance or base of trust, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is needed. So I've, I um, in my opinion, like you need to have uh, a common sense of, of trust in the team so that you don't get punished when you speak out or uh, that people don't try to make fun out of you because you, you ask like a question which has come to your mind and it's like a, a valid point to just discuss it, even if it may be like funny for some, but for others, it may raise some other thoughts uh, regarding innovation or even problems which may occur. Mm -hmm. I think there is no single answer to that uh, very relevant question here. Uh, just, just a couple of ideas that I would have. And I know that there is at least a second coach uh, in here, a facilitator in here that could also add some ideas. Um, hello, Kai. So Kai is my uh, co-founder and, and he's also uh, in here. Um, one or two ideas. One is that I always try to um, make sure visually that the room where we do the workshop is a different world than the outside world. So by, um, I said that rooms make invitation by, by trying to establish a circle that already psychologically people see by, by uh, stepping in, ah, this is somehow different than I'm used to. Um, so this is one very first uh, thing. The second that I think of is on a team level uh, to, and I forgot that uh, when, when I was talking about enabling constraints, to work on, on, an, on a short um, team agreement or workshop agreement um, with the team in the beginning. So um, how do we work together? What is, what is okay to speak up? Uh, are, we, are there means to stop someone from blaming me or things like this? So basic rules and principles, how we want to work together in the workshop. And the third idea that I would have is a little bit uh, provoking. What, uh, maybe for an introduction round or something, what, what is a topic that no one would speak up here in this company? Maybe something to test already what's in there. And maybe there are more ideas. And I, I would open up. I, I would, uh, Jörg, if, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not the one who fully, um, necessarily answers this question here. Maybe there are more ideas in the room. Yeah. How to build trust with a group of people if you're not aware of the culture in the company? I think the only way that you can build trust with people is actually by working with them and getting to know them. There's mm -hmm. no like, there's, there's no secret trust source. Um, you can't go and drink from a magic fountain or do anything like this. So you, you actually need just have to work with them. And if you're new somewhere, I think the thing that you, that I found is important is to you give people trust to start with. Mm -hmm. You assume that people are going to do the right thing. You assume that things are going to go well, or you don't go there. Um, and if that's the case, and then you work together with these people in whichever format it is on whichever projects or tasks that you work together with, then you will either learn to trust them or realize that some of these people may be less trustworthy than others, which would be unfortunate, but it does happen. Yeah. So my experience from this year was, or last year, uh, with a number of online workshops, um, that uh, the best workshops that I have been in uh, always try to create a level playing field at the beginning. So it was always a good idea to have before the actual workshop happened, a get to know the tools and get to know each other event. 
So because there is sort of a digital divide, you have uh, mouse jockeys who play Fortnite in their spare time and they are faster on the trigger than you ever will be. Um, and so it's good to us to, to look, to have everybody look at the tools outside of the actual working uh, environment meeting so that it's less stressful. And that helps a lot because then when the actual work starts, everybody comes together, everybody knows where everything is. And um, so you don't have to explain that. That, that is one thing that helps uh, building trust also. Um, and from an onboarding perspective, because I, I, I followed a lot of colleagues who did uh, onboarding or mass. So basically I had to hire new people. And I don't know, Lo, if, if you want to talk about that because your company does that exemplary, um, how you have something offline. So you get something and then you invite people to make them comfortable online and all that stuff while you cannot be in the office. Um, so um, having an offline component in some way or shape helps. So getting a package where there's a nice letter in it and something that you can show off in the first online meeting is a, is a nice icebreaker and is a nice thing to get new people to, hey, they really like me, they send me a present. That it's the same present for everybody. Nobody cares, but you got a present. You got a package. So that's the, that's the. <laughs> but uh, as stupid as it sounds, uh, it helps, as far as I've seen it. So that these are two two of my experiences from last year. Moment, mm -hmm. oh. you mentioned me. I'm not really in that onboarding process organization at Kreuzwerke, but. Um, as you said, Jörg, that's really, we have our HR and office management department is especially in these times, they work very hard on get in touch with the people, with the remote people. We hire a lot of new people. We never met them in person. We just have this meet new people in the internet section. And you have the feeling every week that pops up a new name and a new guy in a new department. And I know from, from our HR and onboarding department that they, as you said, they sent them letters. We have an onboarding process they go through. And it's not only from the organizational part, it's also this getting in touch and send a package and send a letter and things like that. So yeah, that helps yeah. a lot, but not only for new people, also for the existing people when someone is sick or someone has something, we always get a little, hi, we are still here. Hi, how are you? We have this, yeah. That's, that's good, good. That gives you a good feeling and I think that builds trust. Because the saddest tweet that I saw last year is somebody tweeting about changing jobs. Uh, shutting down my laptop, putting it into a FedEx envelope, receiving a FedEx envelope, unpacking the new laptop. So that was one of the saddest tweets last year um, because the person changed companies. And that was the basically the whole, hey, I'm in a new company now experience. You got a separate FedEx envelope and <laughs> got a new laptop. So, um, and, and that's, why I, that's why I think what Lo mentioned this, this offline um, and, and aside moments where you really individually contact people and do something offline in com combination with the online thing um that's that's really important so yeah um thomas and i we had um our own little coming together trust challenge this year because in the middle of the year we decided we needed more people to help us with implementing our new product and um in the end we had a team assembled of um you know a person from colombia a person from ukraine a person from poland we had never seen them before and we started working with them uh, beginning of July. Um, and what we, I mean, there's always two dimensions. There's the human, I would call it, or personal dimension of getting to know each other and trust each other. And there is the professional dimension. Now for the human dimension, I think what we did was we did like a pretty long, uh, you know, um, kicking off our team, like half a day online with, 
individual breakouts where people were talking about their private stuff and then trying to get to know each other. And we went through a whole string of structures to, you know, getting um, used to each other as uh, human beings, learn from each other and from the different cultures. Um, and then uh, what we, on the professional side, uh, we actually, from day one, established some ground rules. Um, for example, that whenever we communicate, or communicating, including video. So not it having- It was a challenge at the first week, yeah. <laughs> it was a challenge at the beginning because one of our guys had a really bad internet connection and uh, video was more like still pictures every five seconds. Um, but after a short while, that was um, um, much better. Um, and it helped a lot. Uh, we had rules like, I mean, we, we trusted them as a, we gave them trust to do the jobs and we gave them space to, you know, uh, um, move forward and did not blame them when things went wrong, for example, but looked at the outcome and did we on a, a retrospective on a weekly basis together looking at how can we do, uh, how can we improve situations, not just working amongst each other, but also in the product itself. And what are, one of the best parts of the whole summer experience as a fully remote team, was when we finally decided to part ways because we had achieved our intermediate goal. Um, the feedback we received from 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 our um, remote colleagues because they all of, they all said they had never been working in such an environment um, um, where they you know had the space to explore to experiment um, to to bring their um, you know their, their uh, strengths forward and, and sometimes even fail and get good feedback to advance and to learn. And I think that is what, what you're actually looking for in the end, that um, you, you find those two planes, this human plane and the professional plane, um, that though are, these are connected and, and people really like to, to work to each other, uh, with each other. Um, and that is possible even when you start remote from the beginning. That's what we learned this summer. It's not, not fantasy land. <laughs> and maybe one little aspect, we established a music channel in Slack. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> Good point. That, that also helped to see the other individual as a human being with, I don't know, preferences and, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, music is anyway uh, something that connects. We did not sing to Like him. <laughs> <laughs> And Slack has some nice features for that. We implemented that in our Slack, for example, the donut meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you're a small company, maybe that is a bit annoying because you have only four people and you meet them all, every time. But for a bigger company, you are randomly uh, put together with the people you don't talk daily with. So that's quite nice. And the other thing is called moment. Um, water water blah blah water cooler in water cooler slack gives you random questions you can answer or you don't for example today was the question what's one thing you wish you could change about the world and mm -hmm. there are off topic discussions there which are quite interesting you know your teammates better there I have a question regarding the, uh, if I may switch to a different topic. I have a question regarding the, the basic architecture um, thoughts about Ting Online. So what you showed us is that, that basically Ting uh, provides a two-dimensional playing field like a board game. And then you can basically add components like let's say Miro or Slack or whatever for certain functionality. Mm -hmm. um, is that a correct impression that I got from your slides and from what I've read before? The collaboration part is I would love to uh, show them live, but it's still prototype stage. But the conversation part, yes. Yes. It's a two dimensional okay. space, like a 2D player game where you um, shape these conversations. Mm -hmm. And then basically, uh, but what you showed in your slides, so the idea is basically that I have kind of a 
a seamless integration. So not screen sharing, but the the collaboration tool, whatever I'm using, like Miro or, or Slack, is part of that 2D board somehow. Um, the, these, um, is it a canvas, a map, a document, or whatever, whatever. video, whatever yeah. it might be, um, are the starting points or anchor points for conversation and also for the collaboration uh, later on? Yes. So there okay. could be multiple um, in the in the space. And interestingly, in preparation uh, for this talk, I tried to to see if I could bring Jira or Confluence into one of these frames. Didn't work. <laughs> Currently, okay. I, I don't see a chance to do that. So uh, they, they not even run in old style uh, iframes. So there are a lot of attempts to bring something into Jira or Confluence, but I was not able to do it uh, the other direction. Um, yeah. It's a no-brainer with uh, with Google Docs or whatever. So Miro has a plugin where you can actually integrate um, Jira issues as cards on the canvas. But, We're working so, with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah, but that is the only thing that I know that works, and it doesn't really really work. So not really nicely. So, but um, so um, it's a nice discussion tool, but nothing else. Um, so um, also question. Yeah. About, uh, so let's say that somebody can't attend the meeting. How can I present what we were discussing and so on? That's the common problem that we have, right? Especially for people that are in different zones and so on. So is it any like recording of what we did there or like at least like history of changes or something like that? I want to answer. <laughs> I mean, there, as uh, Thomas said, we at this point in time, we have implemented the conversation and autonomy parts of the tool. Um, we, we think, and this is now what I'm, what I'm now saying is, um, the, is future. We think that all the materials that you basically create during such a meeting, they would be collected and hand curated into a, um, and stored somewhere for people to access offline. Um, I'm not exactly sure the recording feature. Um, I mean, personally, um, I would say is a lot of people object to be recorded live and our video avatars, they are live. So it's not just a picture of you being moved around. Mm. Um, it is live video inside the video avatar and you can size it to like half the screen and you really see details and you can see in the background of my uh, <laughs> home office what's on my little couch over there. Um, so a lot of people don't have that, don't think that this is something they want. And we don't want them to turn off their video completely because we think it is important that people see each other and can work with the visual um, dimension as well. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if and when we would allow recordings. Um, on the other hand, I mean, you can install a video recorder on your computer and just record the screen. So um, I, I don't, yeah, the, the putting the documents together and having a offline available uh, documentation that we will support, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm also not big fan of recording and so on because mostly it's boring and if the meeting takes two hours and there are only 10 minutes interesting, you need to spend two hours on 10 minutes interesting content. So I'm more like fan of highlighted important stuff or like doing right. like some kind of history of what changed and what is important maybe with side notes or something. And, yeah, and currently there are no tools that I know that can support like that. And mm -hmm. that's the something that I faced personally. One, one other aspect which I almost forgot was when we talk about, I mean, the sweet spot of that, that we try to address is innovation and that works in real time. Okay. So it requires people to interact in real time. Um, and what you spoke about is like information transport for somebody who later on tries to read up on something. Um, that's probably also why it won't be at the forefront of our backlog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the, the, the recording aspect is only useful for either later review or to include somebody who wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And 
I know, like from my experience personally, um, I started a new company last year and a lot of people sent me links to videos, to recordings of meetings, to things that I could have watched, which I just didn't because it's just that who's got time for that? Like that's like, I got sent links to like 24 hours worth of like meetings I could have watched. I like, if I didn't have to be in those 24 hours of meetings, I'm happy. Like, can somebody just tell me the important decisions? Like, you know, bullet points, this was decided. These are the new rules. Yeah. This is what we're doing. But nobody, like nobody, don't take this badly, Yerk, but nobody's going to watch this really and have a lot of fun with it, like in the future. I'm, I'm going to. This part. No, I'm going to watch it for editing. So yeah, I'm you're, possibly you're... I'm possibly the only person who watches this whole hour or something, okay. and <laughs> at least and once, not, not if not twice. So and once you edit it and cut out my disparaging comment about video, it'll be a lot nicer, of course, for everybody else to watch. But yeah, it, so it's I... not it's not so common. So I think that the important part is highlighting bits and taking yeah. out you know the two minute like that yeah. was the important takeaway from the meeting or that was the important announcement. That's why I'm looking forward to next week's uh, presentation with this macro that records everything to Confluence directly, where you can basically push a button and say, hey, here's my message and put it on a Confluence page. Yeah. Uh, I'm a short, so TikTok style, basically. Uh, <laughs> that, that, um, that is, uh, that, that's something that seems to be interesting because it gives you a, a, an opportunity. Because I, on the other hand, I've talked to a lot of software developers and, and, and people who do create stuff who say video is very helpful because it saves me hours of writing. I can just show stuff and that's it. So demo videos, but that's not what you have in mind. You are talking about a collaborative workshop style that's environment. A, it's a one thirty or two minutes explaining something. Yeah, yeah something, but-, but um, I would add probably one thing, if you use um, let's say a presentation, some kind of document, or in the workshop, people were working with virtual whiteboards and had uh, canvases filled out and stuff like that. Yeah. This is valuable information for those who want to deep dive a little bit further beyond the obvious, this was the decision and this was the reasoning. Yeah. So we think that this needs to be made available separately in a, in a, in a packaged format so that somebody who didn't attend uh, can look at it later later on but it's um asynchronous way and it's uh, like a, a, a browse it on your own kind of thing yeah. rather than watching two hours of video trying to fight the right five seconds uh, when somebody makes a, a statement <laughs> and there, there, yeah. Yeah. yeah and there are auto editing solution which mm -hmm. solutions which do not work very well uh in broadcasting for example mm -hmm. um but What's really always missing is I have an artifact like a canvas, mm -hmm. and then I have I I'm I'm missing the context. I'm missing the conversation about the results mm -hmm. on the canvas. And if somebody invents a tool that allows me to click on a part of the canvas and then I get the video for that part of the canvas, where people actually discuss what they write in that box, that is the holy grail. But and how they uh, came to that conclusion? Exactly. But there is no automatic thing that I know that does that. There are st there's stuff in broadcasting for home shopping and stuff like that, where you have auto tracing of, of a sweatshirt or something, and you click and click mm. on that sweatshirt and you can buy it. And that, that is, that happens automatically these days. So they can just mark the sweatshirt and then it gets tracked. Um, and there are auto tracking solutions that you can use for broadcast and, and all that stuff. Uh, but there's nothing that, that does that in a workshop. That would be really, really helpful. But everything else, I agree with you, having two hours of video is, uh, is useless. So it's nice for me because I'm a librarian and I put all that stuff in a library. Um, if ever I could use it, that's why I have shelves on every wall in my, my, my flat, basically. Um, so um, Good but, insulation. Yeah, but for everybody else, for everybody else, it's it's pretty much useless. If you do not have a time index and that takes time, and you you really edit the video and make links to artifacts that are somewhere else, and if ever somebody comes up with an AI solution that does that automatically or whatever, I guess that would be worth a lot of money, really, really, really a lot of money. Because and that and, would... and and there, uh, thanks for that idea because there there is a. a 
a, a cloud of ideas here, yeah. I think. Um, I had a, a, a user interview today and uh, we also talked about, yes, you are able to move as an avatar on this space with your, with your face essentially. Mm -hmm. And then you're working on Miro, but then in between there's nothing. And then you have your hand on Miro, so to say, on the sticky yeah. note. And the view into Miro is an individual view. And it's um, a similar issue than your, your Zoom recording um, a little bit that what do you show in the recording? The, 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 the experience of a single individual is somehow artificially the best um, experience that's, mm. that's open to, to, to answer. Yeah. And I, and I have another thing that, that, um, that I'm working on currently and hopefully get it done by the end of the month so that I finally have MacGyvered something where I can stand in front of the board again. So that I'm not just a talking head, but I have a very large chroma key screen behind me and somehow my Miro board is behind me and I have a wireless mouse and it takes a bit of dexterity, but you can do it. Um, and you have to, of course, be aware that your right hand is your left hand and your left hand is your right hand and all that stuff. So um, all that bullshit. Um, but standing in front of the board again, because I had workshops, for example, with Alberto Pandolini, event storming workshops online, we had a kind of a nervous breakdown at the beginning of all this because he read, he wrote a blog post, oh God, oh God, oh God, how I'm, how I'm going to do event storming, short version, uh, because he basically did thousands of these workshops in the last 12 years and always in front of a whiteboard. And if you ever have seen him in a room uh, as a facilitator, he's perfect. So he's, he's really good. Um, and now he was basically in lockdown in Bologna, um, making his own pasta, which is also very good. But um, And then how do you do an event storming session as a talking head? That's difficult. So, and I would at least like to get in front of the board again, especially if I explain something or sorting a timeline or whatever, um, so that I have this view again, me standing there and you have my that's also a topic. Um, there's this discussion, how much is lost in, in nonverbal communication. So body language, posture, my posture is bad every day in any situation. I'm, I'm not a good example for posture, never have been. So, um, um, but you, you understand what I mean? You, you are, these days you are a talking head. Uh, and in a room in front of a whiteboard, you are, a complete three-dimensional person yeah. um, with, with, with all the nuances. And there's this, this uh, I, I always say, it's an Armenian fellow who wrote this, who started this whole discussion in the 70s um, with Silent Messages was the original title. Uh, I always forget his name. I cannot pronounce his name. But there was this, there's this quote from him that 75% of communication are lost if you're just talking. And, um, that's bullshit. That's not what he wrote, but a lot is lost uh, in, in if you lose that three-dimensional whole figure kind of presentation. And I hope that I have MacGyvered something by the end of the month where I at least have a simulacrum of that. And Jörg, we're talking about the one or two percent of the masters here who are able to, I have a big green screen, I have the software to, yeah, to do exactly. the key and, and things like this. So this is possible. I'm pretty sure you, you're able to do it, but it's it's not practical for mainstream. I think. No, no, no. And that's that's another question that I have, and that's that's also something that most tool tool uh, providers cannot answer me. Uh, is how do you bridge the digital divide? Because you have said you had one you have one person in the group who has a bad internet connection. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have all these animations going on and everything. So that requires a laptop with a decent graphics card if you don't pre-render all that stuff. Um, and the more, and, and, and I have seen very large Miro boards with a hundred people on it. And it, yeah, my, the, the, the ventilators on my laptop basically run over time just to get this animation going. Um, and how yeah. do you bridge that digital divide? That it's especially you, you mentioned satellites, and we had uh, events or presentations, or we have events uh, with Atlassian where there's a guy, there's a very nice fellow from Nigeria joining us every time, 
and he's always the, the 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 person on the outside because his internet connection is crap. Always is. So he has something yeah. to say. He starts saying it and then disappears. Um, think... and there's another very nice fellow from Kenya who has not the same problem because internet is better in Kenya, but um, that's um, this digital divide is always there. You never have a level playing field. Mm -hmm. As you and you don't have to go to Kenya for that, Jörg. I spoke yeah. to a friend of mine yesterday who works at a German bank. <laughs> and she told me that they are not allowed to turn on video because their network crashes all the time because of yeah. that. So they're using WebEx without video, for example. Uh, uh, yeah, and then I have another, I have a friend who works, who lives outside of Cologne uh, in Bergischen Land. Yeah. And he cannot get an Ethernet and a DSL connection above, what was it, 10 Mbit or something. And that's it. So, but these uh, are issues. I mean, there is a. My background is telecommunications, um, not necessarily DSL or so, but uh, wide, wide area networks. Mm. But there is a certain level of issues that we cannot solve as Ting, uh, or Zoom, or WebEx. Yeah. Um, they have to be solved on the underlying layers of our communication. Yeah. Um, but what we can solve is the interaction of the user with the um, tool, the user experience. So even with a very good internet connection, it is my experience when you have workshops with people who, are, who do not use Miro on a daily basis, who do not use Teams on a daily basis, you spend an awful lot of time helping them along. It starts with logging in, it starts and it continues with uh, uh, not dropping out, knowing what they are supposed to be doing now, which button to click and so on and so forth. So it is a, a tool, to, uh, there's quite a lot of skill required to be fluent in these uh, tools. And that is also the reason why we're not very in innovative anymore because a lot of our brain power goes towards mastering the technology. Yes. Technology stands between us and being creative. I mean, with pencil, whiteboard, and post-it, even like little kids can work immediately. Um, but that's not the case anymore. So that's why we have uh, put a lot of emphasis on designing easy to use user experiences and UIs um, mm -hmm. rather than, uh, uh, you know, and that's probably also part of why we uh, haven't been as faster at rolling out some of the features because there is a lot of things to learn and understand first on our part. <laughs> what's what's we interesting, yeah. uh, if, if you mentioned or indirectly mentioned that one, what's interesting with um, the APIs you're using when providing video in an, in an application is how deep this metaphors and concepts of rooms and things go into the APIs. So if you want to want to open that up, um, you need to work with what what is there, and and breakout rooms, small group rooms, big group rooms are part of all these APIs um, that we have today. Um, yeah, yeah. And and what most people forget, and is audio. Mm -hmm. Because one of the biggest problems of Zoom is that it's mono. So it's one mono audio channel. There's no surround. There's no, there's no uh, audio mix, not even a stereo mix. And we had an, uh, we had a Hopin event last year. So an event, a conference on Hopin with 90 people and had a cafeteria where basically 30 people were there at the same time. And Hopin, funnily enough, delivers a stereo mix, mm -hmm. which is, um, as strange as it sounds, it's 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 something else. If if two people try to talk at the same time in Zoom, the result is garbage because of this mono channel, um, because just the, the voice stuff gets compressed into one mono channel and that's garbage. Mm -hmm. But with Hopin, that was not as uh, not as uncomfortable as in uh, as because it was a stereo mix, in a way. So you had at least a bit of wiggle room for two people trying to talk at the same time, which is a funny effect um, uh, because it was a lot. I, I for example, Hubert was there. Uh, I felt a lot more comfortable talking in that environment than I do on Zoom, especially. With, Zoom. Without actively putting them onto a certain place in the stereo area. Yeah, I don't know what they do in the background, but but um, there was obviously something um, 
I don't know, some kind of magic working to, to manage the audio. Mm -hmm. But, um, and also the, from the recordings, the recording output is stereo. So with the Zoom recording that I get, it's just a mono channel and one just one channel. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that gets overlooked um, because a lot is audio. Um, also for the, the environmental feel. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's something that, that I find uh, challenging with all these discussions. You, you said the, the metaphor of a room is very deeply ingrained in these tools, but mm -hmm. acoustically, it's not a room. Acoustically, it's a two-dimensional sheet of paper. So it's, it's nothing. Yeah. So, um, so mono is the equivalent of a 2D environment. So basically. I mean, look, kind of trying to get around to Ting again, we have this, I would call it an overarching theme that we call spatial awareness, mm -hmm. which at this point in time is, I would say 95% uh, revolves around um, everybody has the same appearance of where everybody else is. So you can easily form a circle or with the video avatars and then the, the facilitator says, let's start with Thomas and go clockwise. And then for everybody is clear who's the next person, for example. Um, it, but uh, on our list, it's also to use that spatial awareness thing for the audio part. So if I am in the middle of a two dimensional or if I'm in, on a two dimensional plane, I have other video avatars that are above me, below me, left to me, right to me, or in some relation to myself, we could use that information to mix audio in such a way that mm -hmm voice coming from the right side, voice coming from the left side, helps us to um, basically orientate, our, orientate ourselves and, easy, and better understand what is going on in our um, virtual rooms. Yeah, but that's I, a whole other story, which probably is down the road a couple of months. Before. Yeah, and it's, I, if, I, if I believe my nephews, because I'm not a Fortnite player myself, but uh, in, 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 in online video games, you really, they really have those effects. Yeah. Because it's a question of life and death if fire comes from the right or from the left. So, uh, <laughs> and you have to move to the right or to the left to take cover. Uh, and they have that, um, they have that, they, they have some kind of magic that, that scales that up to multiplayer thousands of people, basically. Mm -hmm. That is, that is, I think, a very nice, would actually be a nice research area to look at these. Um, yeah, these first person shooters, basically, uh, how they handle. Um, spatial audio, um, because there it's really. And, uh, so I can tell you that it's even more interesting because you have a seven zones of sounds. So if you have a gaming set like I do, I have right now. So it's a razor with also moving stuff. So it's vibrate plus you have a seven zone. So front, two in the sides, and four in the back. So you have a seven zone even of the uh, shootings zones no. so it's not only stereo it's more like a surrounding of yeah. you so the technology currently for first person shooters is awesome like yeah. zoom combined with doom for those who are old enough yeah i think, I think we're, we all look old enough for doom I do me doom eternal i beg you doom eternal <laughs> is one of the hottest games of the last two years <laughs> well, i'm talking about doom one and quake one and... <laughs> Wolfenstein and things like that. I, I, I was stepping out in the late 90s already. <laughs> but um, I, I think for me, the hardest thing with audio is the lack of feedback because people have such good etiquette right now that they all turn off their, their microphones. And then if they have their video off as well, and I'm telling one of my really old bad jokes and I want them to laugh half-heartedly at those, I don't get that feedback. And that's something that I, I really miss. You know, see, Jörg, I can see you like smiling in the background. That's fine. <laughs> but there's three people here who have no idea whether they're just off having a cup of coffee or like doing something else. And that makes it incredibly hard because if, if you're used to this kind of crowd interaction and you're used to, to talking to people, you, if you don't get any feedback, it's kind of like the first few times, it's almost shocking. That's what most uh, of the facilitators we interviewed told us as well. It's the biggest problem they see is 
understanding the dynamics in the virtual room as it, I mean, in comparison to like a real world room where they, even without um, talking to the people, they can sense um, the room and, and, and areas where there's contention or areas where they have fun moving forward and stuff like that. It's all gone. Um, makes it really hard for many of them to be as useful as before. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and there's these strange effects like if I'm looking at you, I'm not looking at you because now I'm looking at the screen, looking at you, but I'm looking down. <laughs> if I wanted the effect to look at you, I have to look straight into the camera. But then I'm actually not looking anymore at you. I'm looking at the camera, so um, that's that's a that's a very strange effect. So that's 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 one of the most disconcerting effects in a in a video conference. There's a group somewhere I've forgotten what they call, but they're trying to make an AI which basically tilts everybody's camera angle up. I can see yeah. a couple of people nodding. Does anybody remember what it's called? No, I have um, to look that up. Thomas, you researched yeah, this. You should know. Uh, I don't remember. I know that Apple did some research um, uh, with AI to correct the, the, the yeah, image a little bit. It was, um, it was another there, group. There is a more recent one, but I don't remember the name now. And the, um, the videos but, look great mm -hmm. that they showed. Yeah. So in the beginning, I, I thought it would make sense to have four or eight cameras in your monitor. Um, to, to do that, to, to not have this, this angle, but meanwhile, they're doing it software-wise uh, very well. So I think that will be standard in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. And there's an extra drill a hole through your screen, stick a camera in that. <laughs> there's actually a next generation of devices where the camera can be behind the screen. So the, somebody yeah. demoed a, a smartphone where the, ca where, the, where the camera is actually, and the front-facing camera is actually invisible. Mm -hmm. So it's behind the screen. And then nothing nothing hinders you to put this, the, the camera in the middle of the screen. And then you are looking at the camera again. So yeah, yeah. yeah but still smartphones, the cycles are, I don't know, nine months. Meanwhile, yeah. with, with uh, monitors, it's a bit different. I don't know. <laughs> and with laptops, it's also still three to five years. So that's, um, and if you have a Mac, it can be even longer. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, I, mm -hmm. yeah. I would have one thing without breaking this very interesting conversation. I feel that the dynamics of this talk are not necessarily like, let's go to Ting now. That's what we also thought about. But what I would like to invite you to is we have a session on Friday. If you feel like I want to see Ting, not only talk about it, but also see it, uh, join us on Friday. Or if that time, I just put it into the chat. If that time doesn't work for you, always feel free and invited to drop us a message if you're interested in more. Okay. Or you have an idea what you want to talk with us. Um, so we are a startup, we are very approachable and... Yeah, so actually we have an idea because... Um, you have an idea. Yeah, <laughs> no, I talked to you, talked to you about that. We have, we have this developer event plan, plan, planned for March 18th, mm -hmm. where we wanted to do workshops with developers mm -hmm. during an afternoon. Um, and what it, would it be possible to to use thing thing sorry thing for that already in March? What kind of workshop? What, what do you have in mind? Um, so or... I was I was thinking about kind of a of a mob processing programming session, something like mm -hmm. that. So remote mob programming format, um, something in that that order. Um, so somebody does a programming demo, you share an online IDE or something and uh, everybody else can comment and share the, the console basically mm -hmm. uh, or editor, whatever. Mm -hmm. So something like that, would that be possible? I think we have still some homework to do here. So, okay. I, so... I, I always, um, um, enjoy these conversations and still to be able to have kind of a shared uh, screen for every of these smaller conversations. Mm -hmm. So there could be multiple of them. Um, having that a good user experience is still, as Kai would say, in the backlog, not too okay. deep, but. <laughs> okay. No, because we were thinking to make this a multi-platform event, which I also haven't tried before. 
So maybe have a main conference center on Hopin and have a hangout space in Wondami and a workshop space in Ting mm -hmm. Online, for example. So that and then everybody can get to the other platform with a click or something. That would be that is something that we are looking at. But okay, yeah. Um, and I'm looking forward. Um, uh, and there's, there's also a trend now in the conferencing arena that uh, no presentations anymore. Mm -hmm. The first one is in February, Domain Driven Design Europe. I don't know if you know the guys and girls around Anneke and Matthias Perez and Anneke Skonians. And they decided this year to um, have a conference with hands-on labs only, no presentations. They said, uh, we have five years of presentations on YouTube. If you want to see a presentation, you are welcome to watch one in our mm -hmm. archive. Mm -hmm. But the conference itself will be on Hopin and it will only be hands-on labs a whole week, basically. Um, um, Jörg, I was here, I, I heard what Thomas was saying, but I think um, what I would like to do is get together with you for maybe 30 minutes and you explain a little bit better how these mob programming sessions are envisioned by yourself. And then maybe we can take it from there uh, and I mean, at least draw from it one of these structures that we may implement down the road. Yeah. That is an area, I mean, when I was listening to you, mob programming wasn't necessarily on our list of things that we would actually look into. A new scenario, yeah. <laughs> that is, that's, I, I, I guess if you do software development, you have heard of Woody Zuil. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, who, who started this whole mob programming thing. Yeah. And he has been spending also um, more out of necessity than out of conviction. He has spent a lot of time in the last half year together with a few other people uh, to develop a remote mob programming format with a shared IDE. And there are some demos on YouTube and some recordings on YouTube about what they did. Um, so just for my understanding, so you're saying there is a, a website out there that allows people already to do virtual mob programming. Yeah, there are, there are, a, few, there are a few online okay. cloud IDEs yeah. that you can share where you can basically like on a conference page yeah. have a have a shared editor and mm -hmm. basically what they build again out of necessity is something like zoom and somebody shares that editor and that is like in a mob programming session that is the driver so that guy or girl has the the the, um, the laptop and everybody else is basically chipping in and uh, developing the solution so the uh, mechanics of the mob programming, let's say, procedure are completely available inside these shared IDEs. Yeah, and there's a, there's a and repository attached and all that stuff. online for the human communication plane. Yeah. Separately, yeah. not integrated. No, yeah. no, there's, there's, a, there's a repository attached. So there's Git integration and all that stuff. So, to it, so if somebody else wants to check out a piece of code and recommit it and everything that that happens in parallel. And Thomas, that could be done now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have to, so as I said in the introduction, Hubert yeah. in, in, in our team, Hubert is the guy who actually knows something about Atlassian. I'm the guy who's just talking, the same with programming. Yeah. Uh, I'm just talking, I, have, I cannot program or at least the last programming that I did was in Turbo Pascal back in the days. That was 1980, I don't know, uh, forgot, 84, I think. So um, <laughs> on an Apple IIc. So that was my last programming experience. Um, except for the programming on an Apple. Yeah. On an Apple. <laughs> no, but um, Back in the day, there was Paul and Paul and Turbo Pascal for Apple was a thing. So um, no, but um, I have to I have to tell you what I'm I'm I've got, I'm going probably going to spend or we are probably going to spend the next three weeks finding people who are actually willing to do something like that, and I'm trying to convince them to do that as a mob programming session. Okay. So, and if I have those people, I will come back to you and uh, talk to you. This is what we want to do. These are the guys and girls who want to do it. Um, 
And then, then these, those 30 minutes make sense. Absolutely, because I mean, yeah. if, if you would, if, if this is more like a side by side, there's not a, I mean, we could probably do it right away, but if, yeah. if you think about fully integrated seamless inside a Ting screen, that is a different story. No, no. So it depends a little bit on what you are asking. No, but but I really like the idea of a two day two D canvas, mm -hmm. and and if like in Wonder Me, the, the really stupid thing is that these avatars are just avatars. There's no video inside the yeah. circle, and if in your solution there's actually live video within that circle that I'm dragging, that's a really cool thing. Yeah. Um, and I would like to test something like that as early as possible. Okay, then uh, that is that that would be because that that sounds like a really, really, really cool environment and a really cool solution. Um, Friday, four o'clock, Thomas, I think. Uh, no, no, the, no, no, the, no. The, the, the public or kind of yeah, if, if public yeah. is three o'clock, but um, if you want to try something with Jörg, he's always welcome outside. Yeah, no, but that's, yeah. that's not but everybody else. I mean, if you nope. want to join us Friday at three o'clock. Yeah. And that's that's, that's that would be the next step. I I will be joining you definitely Friday at three three p.m. And uh, then when I when we know what we want to do in March and how many people we have to do workshops, I will get back to you and tell you this is what we want to do. These are the mm -hmm. three workshops we have planned. How can we set this up in Ting Online? Good. So that would sounds be, good. And if if I don't find anybody for a workshop, it it would be a waste of your time. Mostly mm -hmm. uh, to have that now. Yeah. So, Good. Okay. Perfect. We are still we are still eight people. Hey, where is everyone? So um, <laughs> I have question, as well. questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, what is your guys' experience or? Let's say best practice for good uh, remote innovation sessions, because like um, I know that there's like plenty of uh, signs about like what's the perfect group size to build like uh, good innovation culture so that you can like uh, innovate uh, to the fullest. But it's like also on the composition of the team. How is your experience on? How, how many people, what kinds of people, uh, usually it was like, from my experience, is like a bad idea to have like just ex extroverts uh, on one team <laughs> together because they are just like talking and like uh, don't have like the well thought through process of an introvert, uh, but they are like good to bring teams together and push forward. What is your experience? Hmm, that's a good question. That, I mean, that some some context here. Maybe I take uh, one of the aspects, which is the the um, um, the more loud people that 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 you that you named. I think the no matter if you talk about remote meetings or meetings in a room, the advantage of well balanced structures is to give everyone a voice. Um, time boxes could be part of it. So a simple structure like a circle, everyone has a minute or something like this and inviting people to build on the ideas of uh, others instead of doing the yes, but um, game that we all do. So this is one thing. And then I think the remote environment gives us even, even more chances to, um, to also um, support the introverts um, if they um, are able to f to switch off camera, work on their own on a on a whiteboard or um, on, a, on a on a on a document, and then um, as a facilitator, think of both of these camps that are not really separate camps of the extroverts and introverts to um, yeah use different kind of thinkings for what you want to uh, do with the group. Mm. And this was just this one aspect doesn't answer this. Uh, what's the ideal team size? <laughs> Um, to be honest with you, uh, Frank, very seldomly I was able to select the right people. Yeah. I simply had the people I had and we were asked to come up with something new or develop some new ideas or figure out how to tackle certain problems. So I think it's more important that you design a flow and a structure in these uh, events 
that helps to balance the, let's say, imbalances that you have maybe in your in, in the team itself. Um, I I also think that it sometimes help helps to bring completely different people from the outside in disruptors, especially if you're looking for something new. Um, um, if you even as a coach, when you work long for a long period of time with the team, you're kind of becoming sucked into the team culture and you're considered as one of them. So it's hard for you to get um, these, um, let's say, uh, the friction going that you need for creating innovation. Um, and those are the things I would say um, are important. And that you get every, I mean, that you do have a, a, a um, everybody who has an interest um, and a stake more or less in the outcome of that innovation should be represented. So make sure when you invite people that you advertise properly and, and explain everything what the, pur the purpose of the, the workshop is, um, get as many as you can get um, to cover all the bases. And last but not least, I find it very helpful to say it's voluntarily. It's a session to, that we, where we look at new ways. If you are, don't have the mind today to participate, it's totally okay that you don't come. If you have not been asked to come, but you think you want to and you want to cont contribute, you have ideas, you're invited. So tear down these barriers of participation. I think that's important as well. Yeah. Yeah. If you remember these processes that I showed with these divergent thinking, grown zone and convergent thinking, there are two uh, phases in the process of a workshop or a meeting that most people miss. Um, the one is before the meeting, how the invitation is shaped. Um, that's important because um, it, there is this um, in, uh, feel invited if you want to and also start to spark the thinking. And this is kind of the matching process. Am I the right person in this workshop? And uh, after the meeting or at the end of the week meeting, we covered it uh, before is the harvesting. So make sure that this meeting helps us to um, be a, a solid foundation for whatever next steps come and document and harvest and w what was decided, action uh, steps and whatnot. Yeah. I think it's also a good rule. I don't know. I have to look up the exact actual sizes. If you look at the... Um, if you want to take your school class to the zoo as a teacher, there are rules depending on the age of the children, how many people per number of children you need to facilitate such a class. So the smaller the children, the more people you need to take them to the zoo. And you can, you can create an equivalent for, for virtual or online sessions. The less experienced the people are with the format, the more people you need to run I don't know, errands, help people with tools, or if you break them up into work groups, the more experienced the people are, the less you have, less people you need to take care of individual work groups or motivate them to do stuff or something. So that could be a nice analog to this. Uh, so if you have preschool children, you need one teacher, one person per six children. And if you have a, I don't know, and then beyond puberty, it gets more challenging again, because then you need to, <laughs> <laughs> but um, something like yeah. so, something like that, that that could be a nice equivalent, so that you have a kind of uh, grading system. How many? How you organize it? No. With more experienced people, your your group can get bigger, even if you are alone. If you have less experience and less open people that do not have the that have a kind of yeah have to jump across a fence to get used to the this way of working, you need more people to take care of working groups and all that stuff. Yeah, I had with the with the bigger groups, I also had like the, the feeling that people had like, or were less feeling uh, the need to speak out. So it's, they are at a certain threshold of people, I think like people just mostly stay quiet and they don't do not much participate. And that, that's why, why I was asking her. I also saw like, uh, for example, it, of course, it's like funny that you can do like mural boards with like 200 or more people uh, if you don't click on follow or show the mouse pointers, uh, which gives you nightmares. Um, but it's like not really like uh, pushing something forward. So I think like we need to 
what you mentioned with the pre and after work of a meeting is like really important. And we, we I, or at least I, I feel like sometimes there are like some meetings where you need to attend because you don't get a follow up summary of what was the important, what were the important things which were discussed and what was the actual outcome. Uh, so you spend like an hour with uh, two uh, or 60, 80 people or 100 uh, in a room, everyone is watching and, and listening and just because there is no summary. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you mentioned Zoom breakout rooms and all that stuff. That's also a nuisance. Uh, not only that you are, yeah, basically violently taken out of the room once the counter stops, but also that you, that you are unceremoniously dumped in that room when it starts. And I had several workshops where I said, suddenly I was in a breakout room didn't know anyone. And the first question from everybody was, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. Uh, and um, and that's important as well. So, and that depends on how, how you, and that's why I like this 2D canvas because you could integrate a feature where you basically, where the circle basically signals, signals for help. So we don't know what we have to do. So when the circle turns red and you as a facilitator know I have to go into that circle and answer a question. So, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that but mm -hmm. um and that's so important to get keep the discussion going keep the work going and and to frank um you you mentioned people that um, are not able willing or too shy to to contribute i mean that's also part of how you open up the the space in the beginning how you start um the meeting i mentioned this creating a safe space um and that in one case could mean to share a, a moment of silence uh, with each other, looking at each other, seeing each other as, as human beings. In other cases, it could mean to uh, give, question, give a question, an easy question, a light question to a pair of people. And then people feel that they can speak up and it doesn't, nothing happens if they, if they uh, speak up or whatever is needed. I mean, yeah. uh, plenty yeah. of ways. Good guys, it's um, yeah. 20 minutes to eight. At least I have to leave you guys now. So it was very nice meeting you, Thomas. Nice presentation. I saw you're only working on it <laughs> <laughs> today, <laughs> but haven't seen it. So, um, and uh, you help me stay in touch in case you have something in March. Yes, okay. and uh, thank you very much. That was okay. very educational. Okay. It was very nice to talk something about something else than at lesson for a change <laughs> we would um, have a lot of things i had some at lesson in there for, for yeah a moment. of course of course I did. <laughs> and you will find them prominently featured in my edit so <laughs> in case bye -bye. but thank you again so thank you, see you tomorrow, tomorrow. Okay. bye